Hi everybody, Levi Clay here, and I'm back again with another soloing school video. And this is a special one, because this is the first video I've made since being 30. So yeah, I'm a grown up now. Maybe my videos are gonna get better. Maybe they are going to get worse on my ever declining walk towards the grave. Though we shall see, I guess. So this video is actually being made for one of my patrons over on patreon.com. We've been discussing uh, scale visualization and major versus minor pentatonics in my Facebook group. And I thought actually the question was so good that it made sense for me to do an actual proper YouTube video rather than the little videos I'd been putting in my group because I think you guys will all benefit from this. So really the, the guy was asking about um, how to practice parallel pentatonic scales. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's kind of two ways of being able to look at these types of things. You can either look at your scales and modes from a derivative form or a parallel form. And a derivative form would be probably what many of you are already thinking. You play A minor pentatonic, you know that that is the same notes as the C major pentatonic. So those two things have been derived from the same pool of notes and you'll use shortcuts in order to be able to uh, use that information. So if you're playing on a song and it requires you to play G major pentatonic, you'll use that derivative modal theory to say, well, I can just play E minor pentatonic. I'm gonna shoot that down and show you why that's actually in the long run probably going to hinder your playing. So parallel modal theory is where we're creating all of our sounds from a given root. So we don't compare A minor pentatonic to C major pentatonic, we compare A minor pentatonic to A major pentatonic, C major pentatonic to C minor pentatonic. And that's how we're gonna focus on things today. We're gonna look at the key of C. So why is this important? Well, it's, it's quite simple really. Um, if we just take that uh, derivative modal approach to things and we look at the A minor pentatonic scale, that pool of notes, it sounds a certain way and it sounds uh, very minor when I'm playing that, right? He's just gonna keep barking because that's what he does, but that's why you love him and that's why I love him. So anyway, that sounds very minor. And the notes of the C major pentatonic scale, it's the same pool of notes, but played like this. So that's just some playing on uh, C major pentatonic. Now, if you actually rewind and listen to each one of those, I like to think that when you listened to each of them, they sounded different. One sounded minor and one sounded major. Why is that? Why can they, or how can those two things sound different despite the fact that they're the same notes, right? And it's a simple answer. It's because I treat the notes in a different way. A great example of this would be the problem that many of you have probably found yourself in, which is, you can't play major pentatonic convincingly. Let's say there's a C major chord and you wanna play C major pentatonic, but you don't really, you're not great at playing with C major pentatonic, so you just think A minor, you think these notes. Now technically, what I just did there was play the C major pentatonic scale, but we're dealing with the struggle of the electric guitar, or just the guitar in general here, which is we tend to be very shape-based players, and therein lies the problem. You see, when it comes to playing good minor pentatonic vocabulary, <laughs> Just that note right there, you're noticing. I'm bending that note, right? I tend to bend that note. Now, what is that note? That's, that's the note C. Okay, the note C. If I'm thinking major pentatonic and I play minor pentatonic and I bend that note C over a C major chord, I'm bending the root note. I'm bending that root note sharp. And the result of that is never a pleasing sound. You're getting the sound of your C major chord. You're not gonna get a worse sound than that in music, right? 
So what you need to do is you need to think of C major as being C major. And actually, the, the same is true. There are, there's vocabulary that I would play on a C major chord that I absolutely wouldn't play on an A minor chord. I wouldn't, it licks like this. <laughs> can't play stuff like that and call it A minor pentatonic because it just doesn't sound like that. Right. So how are we going to deal with this? Why are you struggling with it and how can we fix it? That's the important thing, right? How are we going to fix this as a problem? So the problem is, at least in my experience of the people that I have taught over the years, is that you're probably dealing with your, your pentatonic patterns as that. You're dealing with them as patterns, physical patterns that you play on the guitar. You see this is A minor. Okay, we need to move away from that. Sure, you're still going to play these geometric patterns on the neck, but I don't want it just to be, I mean, I'm not entirely sure how you think of it, but you could call that one, four, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, four, one, four, because those are the fingers that you're using. However you think of these is absolutely fine. Um, but the point is we need to pay a little bit more attention to what notes we're playing. Not note names, but intervals. Intervals, intervals, intervals. I should really plug my books at this point. I can actually do that just by clicking this button. Ha <laughs> um, if you, If anyone has read any of my books, what you will find is I'm constantly talking about the intervallic structure of all of the licks. Uh, so you can always tie the lick back to the chord. And, uh, you know, that's a, a cheesy little plug there. But any, like I say, anyone that's read them will see that, and it's because that's how I'm thinking. So when I'm playing the A minor pentatonic scale, I'm not just thinking... I'm very aware that this is my root note. And I know that the next note is that minor third. I know that the next note is the fourth, and if I think of a minor chord, the fourth is its not in the chord, so this isn't the strongest note, but it is in the scale. The next note is the fifth, this is in the chord, it doesn't really add a lot, but... I don't really consider it a good note to rest on, but it's a it's a fine passing note. The next note, this is a super important one, and you'll see this when we start blending major and minor pentatonics together, um, is the flat seven. And that note lives a tone below that root note. Now those intervals, one, flat three, four, five, and flat seven, I have those ingrained no matter the position. If I'm playing, if I put my uh, third finger here, I know that here's my flat third, my fourth, my fifth, my flat seven, my root. I've got these sounds nailed all over the neck. I've used the cage system to do that, but the point is, you don't need a system to do that, it's just to focus on the intervals. Be a three note per string player, four note per string player, have no system whatsoever. As long as you're aware of the intervals, you're gonna start tying this stuff together. So if we're just dealing in shape one, what I call shape one, root note on the first finger of the low E string, if I look at the top, I've got my root, my flat seven. That's why that bend sounds so good, because you're bending from the flat seven, which is a cool minor sounding note, and you're bending up to the root note, which is a strong note. So uh, there's our flat seven, then the fifth, the fourth, the flat third. Now you need to spend some time getting really familiar with those intervals in relation to this being our root note. You learn that this is a fifth. This is a flat seven flat third, another flat seven. You need to put the time into that because I promise it will pay off in the long run. So once you've got that down, we then look at that A major pentatonic. And I said I was gonna do this all in C, but evidently we're in A, it doesn't really matter, you can move it absolutely anywhere. Now, the A major pentatonic scale, interval wise, the root, the second, the third, the fifth, and the sixth. So there are notes that it has in common with that minor pentatonic scale, but there are notes that are different. So if the first note is A, the root, major pentatonic scale, the next note is the second degree of the scale. 
And then we have the major third. I always slide into that note. But if I... We need to learn where that second lives. And where that third lives. Next note is the fifth. Well, that's the same note as that minor pentatonic. And then the sixth. So yeah, each one of those intervals, super important. I know what you're thinking though, Levi, this is a lot to take on board. Yeah, of course it is. I want to boil it down to something that you are going to be able to walk away from this lesson with now and be able to actually use and make good music with. So to me, scales are largely academic and uh, not hugely representative of good improvisers' um, understanding of the instrument, at least historically, at least if we're looking at the, you know, the great jazz, fusion, whatever, um, great improvisers. They're not traditionally deep theory guys. There, of course, there are exceptions, but the point is playing scales up and down, up and down, up and down. There's only so much benefit you can get from that. If you practice scales, you'll play scales. What I would rather you did was take a small fragment. In this case, we're visualizing these around this. And major. As in tune as the Telecaster gets, that's constantly going between open E and standard tuning. <laughs> um, yeah, so if we just deal with the top four strings, and we learn the minor pentatonic as being Just learning that as a fingering. Five on the high E, eight, five on the B. Seven, five on the G and then seven on the D. So those are just our notes. And you really want to get familiar with the intervals, so root and flat third, fifth and flat seven, flat third and fourth, and root note on the D. So that's our minor sound. Now, we compare to major. This is the point. This is this uh, parallel modal thing coming in. That's minor. Major doesn't have that flat third on the top. It has the second. Doesn't have the flat seven. It has the six. And it has the third on the uh, G string. After that, I actually like to put that root note in just so I can really hear the chord. If you want to fill the scale out though, you'd really have. Now it's about playing simple little phrases using just those pools of notes and making them sound like the chord to really get to grips with how these two things sit on top of each other and they share some intervals. Because you're never going to be able to combine these two things, these two important sounds together, unless you know each one intimately. So here's a minor pentatonic phrase. Another one. Here's another one. One more. So a few minor pentatonic phrases, you know, all just improvised vocabulary. Now here's some major pentatonic phrases. See how my phrasing is different. See how I'm pivoting off the third here at the uh, sixth fret. And I see that's just being in that chord, right? Notice how I'm going to rely heavily on the sixth. That's uh, found at the seventh fret of the B string. But it's the major sixth degree of the scale. So uh, yeah, here's some major pentatonic vocabulary.
hard for me to not move up the neck and start playing more stuff. But it sounds different. Let me play minor, then major. <laughs> Major then minor. Major then minor. Now, um, just as one last little final idea, because this is really the important thing, as musicians, as improvisers, as players, we don't play scales. I've just tried to make that point to you. It's not about playing scales. Playing music is not about playing scales. Playing music is about playing music. And when you listen to the great improvisers, regardless of style, if they're playing on a dominant seven chord, if we're playing on a blues, a combination of these two scales is a great thing. This can be dangerous because I don't want you to think, oh, so I'm just putting all of those intervals together. If I put them in a linear order, you would have one, the root, second, the flat third, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the flat seven. You get this sort of weird. Add the flat five in there and you've got a mess. But I'm confident that those are the pool of notes that all of your favorite blues players are using but it's not thought of in a linear fashion like that. It's all about what note we're playing at a given time. So we can play something that sounds characteristically major. And then we can hit a bit of a minor flavor by hitting that flat third. So maybe we go. what you find is you'll get these fragments where I can hit the sixth degree of the scale. If I slide up a semitone, I'm on that flat seven. That's not major pentatonic, it's not minor pentatonic. Maybe I go. Great example, just listening to the difference between hitting the flat seven, which is very bluesy, it comes from the minor pentatonic scale, or hitting the sixth degree, which sounds a lot more major. Here's minor. Here's major. So. And seeing the difference between those two things, flat seven, sixth. They're flavours, they're ingredients, and we use them to create the sounds that we want. One of my favourite licks actually is just to hit the root note and slide down to that sixth. Sounds very cool, and it's characteristically not minor pentatonic. If I change that and instead slide down to that flat seven, Sounds all right, but hitting that sixth. Anyway, that's been playing probably a bit too much, but you know, that's, that's how it is. <laughs> anyway, guys, so I'm gonna stop there, but of course, if you have any questions about this, hit me up in that comment section below. I am here to help you, um, and I will help, help as much as I can. Obviously, you're gonna get more help in my Patreon group, which reminds me, I should probably do this. <laughs> uh, yeah, Patreon group, you can join us for as little as $1. Lots of cool stuff going on in there. All about helping you become a better player, a better transcriber, uh, I was going to say a better person, but I'm famous for being an asshole, so maybe not. Um, <laughs> but that's always the goal. Uh, yeah, so if you would like to be like these awesome people, you can check us out on Patreon uh, for as little as a buck. A buck. Can I say that? I'm English. Yeah, a buck. Uh, anyway, you can check us out by clicking this button up here. Subscribe by clicking this button down here, and you'll see two more of my videos here and here. 
And I really do mean that, guys. If you have any questions whatsoever, hit me up in that comment section below. Do subscribe, share this video with your friends. The bigger the channel gets, the more time I can take out of doing all the transcribing to bring you more videos. So yes, it's been a pleasure, and I will see you for another video soon. Bye.